Good evening. In the news tonight, three British hostages were executed in Lebanon as terrorists punished Britain for supporting the U.S. raid on Libya. A woman carrying a bomb was stopped from boarding an El Al flight in London. The U.S. prepared to evacuate several hundred embassy personnel from Sudan. The economy grew at an unexpectedly strong 3.2 percent from January to March. More details of these stories coming up in our news summary. Judy Woodruff is in Washington tonight. Judy? After our news summary, we look at the aftermath of the raid on Libya and its impact on the battle against terrorism with the former head of Israeli military intelligence, a journalist with long experience in the Middle East, and an expert on airline security. Then our series, The War on Drugs, continues. Tonight, the battle against drug producers. It includes an unusual inside look at cocaine processing in Colombia and a debate over how to stop it. Funding for the McNeil Lara News Hour is provided by AT&T. Whether it's telephones, information systems, long distance services, or computers, AT&T. Funding also is provided by this station and other public television stations and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Monday night's U.S. raid on Libya provoked terrorist violence and street protests in many parts of the world. The bloodiest incident was in Lebanon, where three kidnapped British men were found dead beside a highway, each shot once in the head. A note claimed they were U.S. and British spies, executed by Arab commando cells in reprisal for the Libyan raid, which Britain supported. The dead were a writer, Alec Collett, and two teachers, Leigh Douglas and Philip Padfield. A British television journalist, John McCarthy of Worldwide Television News, was kidnapped by gunmen in Beirut. In a third assault upon the British in Lebanon, men in a speeding car filed a volley of grenades at the official residence of the British ambassador in Beirut. The ambassador no longer lives there, and there were no injuries to the Lebanese household staff. A pro-Libyan guerrilla group claimed that its men fired the grenades. The White House said the killings of the three kidnapped Britons bore the marks of Abu Nidal, a Palestinian guerrilla linked to Libya. President Reagan was asked about the incident by reporters. I think it's a tragedy, but I think it's another example of the fact that terrorism is something that we have to deal with once and for all, all of us together. Well, Gaddafi surfaced again and says he's going to continue, suggests he's going to continue to do what he's been doing. And has anyone been able to pin down where he surfaced? Well, it was on television yesterday, but I'm not quite certain whether it was live or tape. Do you know, sir? What? Do you know where he is? No, no, I just think he's been staying undercover while the shooting's going on. A Irish woman was arrested at London's Heathrow Airport this morning after explosives were found in luggage she had planned to carry on a flight to Tel Aviv. Police were looking for the woman's Arab boyfriend, whom they suspected may have planted the time device without her knowledge. We have a report from Andrew Taylor of the BBC. The police had been expecting a terrorist attack and they'd been expecting it to be on an El Al flight. The Israeli airline had been moved months ago to Terminal 1 because it's easier to shut off for security reasons. This morning's incident showed why. Flight LL 016 had a scheduled stop in London on its way to Tel Aviv. When it landed at Heathrow at 10 to 9 this morning, it was directed towards gate 48 instead of its normal station at gate 23 of Terminal 1. By then, the authorities had already been alerted. It appears that an Arab man and his pregnant Irish girlfriend were moving towards the security gates to board the flight. The girl then proceeded to the security gate to hand in her luggage. The bomb was discovered in the false bottom of a holdall and she was arrested minutes later when she reported to claim the bag. Airport security was the focus of a hearing on Capitol Hill today. The head of the Airline Pilots Association said that airport security staffs should be expanded and security officials should be given better training and higher pay to combat terrorism. At the same time, FAA Administrator Donald Engen told a group of reporters that airlines, especially those flying overseas, have tightened their security measures. The White House said that several hundred non-essential diplomatic personnel will be evacuated starting tomorrow from Sudan, where a U.S. embassy employee was shot in the head on Wednesday. Spokesman Larry Speaks said, we are prepared for an increase in terrorism. But he added that in the long run, the administration believes its attack on Libya will reduce the risk to Americans. In Tripoli, there were more anti-American street demonstrations, more unexplained anti-aircraft fire, 
and moves by some of the 18,000 Westerners, mostly Europeans, to leave the country. Last night, the Libyan leader, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi, appeared on television after a two-day absence from public view. We have a report on that from Kate Addy of the BBC. There he was, on television, apparently uninjured, speaking without notes for about 20 minutes. He said that in appreciation of the international situation, he had decided not to escalate military operations in southern Europe. He said that the American attack was aimed at his own house and tent, and it had failed. He denied he knew who planted the bomb in West Berlin, but he also said that Libya had the right, as he put it, to export revolution everywhere in the world. The Pentagon revealed today that there were some problems with some of the planes that took part in Monday's attack on Libya. Five of the 18 Air Force F-111 bombers and two of 14 Navy A-6 attack jets were forced to abort their bombing runs, either because of equipment problems or for other unexplained reasons. At the same time, the Pentagon released film shot by two of the bombers that did make successful runs. Video from one of the F-111s shows that it clearly targeted on a military barracks thought to be the nerve center of Gaddafi's terrorist network. Film from the second F-111 shows a successful bombing run on a row of Libyan transport planes parked on the military side of the Tripoli airport. A group of congressional Republicans today introduced legislation to give a president virtually a blank check to act against terrorists anywhere in the world. Congressional legal analysts said the bill is not likely to win approval without major changes because of its controversial nature. It would require only that Congress be notified after any actions. That concludes our summary of the day's news. Just ahead on the news hour, we look first at the reaction to the U.S. bombing raid on Libya. Will it end up increasing terror attacks? Then our series on the war on drugs continues with a documentary report about a Columbia village that produces cocaine and a debate over U.S. efforts to cut off the supply at the source. Our first focus tonight is the terrorist aftermath of the U.S. attack on Libya. Three Britons found killed in Lebanon, a marine barracks uh, bombed in, uh, firebombed in Tunis, the object of a firebomb attack, the arrest of a bomb-carrying passenger about to board an Israeli plane in London bound for Tel Aviv. We're going to hear three views on what's behind all this and whether the United States can stop it. First, we have an Israeli view. General Shlomo Gazit, was chief of military intelligence in the early 1970s and the principal architect of Israel's anti-terror strategy. Now retired, he was president of Ben-Gurion University and is now vice president of the Jewish Agency. General Gazit, in the long run, will this U.S. attack on Monday night deter uh, terrorists or terrorism and, or make it more angry and more determined? You're talking in the long run. I very much hope that it will deter provided that we don't look at it as an individual act. It's a long war, and we should look at it, at it just as one single phase out of many. And if we go and we stick with the same policy, I hope it will be successful. What about all the groups of terrorists, small groups and large groups, that are not state-supported? Well, uh, state-supported or having shelter by states, or having uh, being provided by weapons, uh, diplomatic pouch and things like that, makes all the difference between one sort of terrorism and those who have no support whatsoever and are totally clandestine, and because of that are very, very unsuccessful. That is, they have no chance really of doing anything big, anything really impressive. Uh, we have almost forgotten about uh, the Red Army in Japan because they don't have any support by nobody. We have almost forgotten about the Red Brigades in Italy or the Bader Meinhof. We do hear only of those organizations that have the support of countries, of states, of organizations. 
In your view, is the United States um, uh, putting more emphasis on Libyan supported and Libyan directed terrorism than the reality um, warrants? And by pointing to its attack on Monday night um, and suggesting that that is going to uh, produce a great improvement in terrorism? Well, I think you're right, right in your question. The United States is putting emphasis on Libya more than, let's say, the role Libya is really playing in the Middle East or in the world in supporting terrorism. But by choosing perhaps the relatively easier target, and if you are, will be successful in teaching Gaddafi, in teaching Libya to disdain from providing that sort of help, it may have its influence and impact on others too. Mm -hmm. In Israel's experience, has um, <coughs> zapping terrorists, and you've had a lot of experience of this, uh, or of attempting to, has it reduced the net amount of terrorism, do you think? Oh, no doubt. No doubt. Listen, we have been now occupying terror territory stories for the last almost 19 years. We are living with an so-called alien population of uh, 1.2, 1.3 million people. And the rate of terrorism is very, very limited. We have been living. I can't say that anything in Israel has really been handicapped because of terrorism. Probably Al Al is now going to be the most successful airline in the world because it's the safest in the world. And look at what happened this morning. What does the incident at London Airport today say to you? I mean, there, there is an airport which has the reputation of being a very well-defended airport. And oh, no. No? Definitely not. No. No, and even with us, it isn't the first incident. By the way, it's the only one of the few airports where our people are not allowed to carry arms because the British don't allow it. But we have had many incidents. Mm -hmm. what, what it did prove to me is that our preventive measures are successful. And I wouldn't say that the, it's a foolproof system. There may be a, always an accident. But nevertheless, we, uh, it's so long that not one single terrorist act against the Al was really successful. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll come back, <laughs> General. Thank you. Judy? We turn now to Robin Wright, formerly the Beirut correspondent for the Christian Science Monitor and the Sunday Times of London. More recently, the author of a book about militant Islam, Ms. Wright joins us from public station WKAR in East Lansing, Michigan. Ms. Wright, should we have been surprised to see this rash of terrorist acts after the raid on Libya? Not at all. In fact, it was quite predictable. I think that many of the groups operating in the Middle East felt that they also were challenged. They also were threatened. And while the vast majority of groups are not linked to Libya, they feel that there is a kind of collective sense of face and that they also were challenged in effect by the U.S. attack on Libya. I think it was quite predictable. Why do they feel connected with Libya if there, if there is no natural tie there? Well, I think the Arab world in many ways uh, has an identity that stretches often across borders, in part because of the Islamic religion. I think it's not... Uh, I can think of, of different groups, for example, in, in Lebanon who uh, have disagreed with Muammar Gaddafi in the past, but because they feel that the U.S. action was aimed at Arabs in general across the Muslim world, that they also have a responsibility now to stand up and let the U.S. know that they're not going to take this. But what about the, the, the firepower that the United States demonstrated? I mean, why wouldn't they be intimidated by that? I think that there's a different kind of mentality in that they are not at all frightened or intimidated by U.S. firepower. I suspect, in fact, that they think this is um, natural. They, they're not intimidated in any way. When they have so little to lose, they're willing to stand up and, and uh, lose their lives now because they feel there's so little to fight for. Well, but you just, uh, you just heard Mr. Gazit, uh, formerly the head of uh, uh, Israeli intelligence, say that he thinks that, deter that acting in retaliation has deterred terrorism to some extent, as far as Israel is concerned. I would ask him to look at the three-year occupation of Israel in southern Lebanon and take a look at the Israeli losses. I think that their iron fist policy in southern Lebanon 
uh, only led to an escalation in violence, and in fact, Israel lost more than 640 men, or the equivalent of 30,000 Americans proportionately, more than half of what the U.S. lost in a decade in Vietnam. Uh, and in fact, uh, Israel had to withdraw from Lebanon, in effect under force, because of the constant escalation of attacks by Shiite militants. Who is behind all that? I mean, you've, you've, you've suggested that they're not, there's not one group, that there are many different groups. But who are we talking about here when we're talking about terrorism in Lebanon, uh, in London, and elsewhere? Oh, I think there are dozens and dozens of different groups. And in fact, one of the most interesting developments over the past two years has been that the traditional groups we've known about, the PLO and even Abu Nidal to a certain degree, um, are not necessarily the main forces at play now. There are a lot of little cells operating in many ways almost independently or autonomously. They'll have loose links with, let's say, Iran or Syria or Libya. But many of their decisions are taken by themselves. They mastermind them, they carry them out. And I think that uh, the, the names that have been coming out lately are an indication. There are all kinds of different names that are very hard to put in any kind of structure to tell where they're going. I think that uh, we're probably going to see the development of a lot of uh, different groups along this line in the near future. And what does that say about the American ability to combat that sort of terrorism? Well, that's why I argue that I don't think military force is a solution to long-term uh, terrorist problems. I think that the U.S. needs to look instead at more constructive alternatives. All right, we'll come back to you in a moment, Robin Wright. Robin McNeil? <laughs> Do you agree with that? The U.S. needs to look at more constructive alternatives than military force? Uh, basically, yes. I definitely agree with it. I would never say that military means is the only answer to terrorist problems. On the contrary, you first have to realize that terrorism is a war. You have to fight this war. If you don't fight it, you, you will be lost. I would go even beyond it. I think that terrorism today is perhaps the biggest menace to civilized society in our era. Never did we have a society that vulnerable as we had it before. Never did we have terrorists with such sophisticated weapons. You couldn't be a terrorist with a dagger, but you can be a terrorist with a tiny bomb, put it in an airplane, and uh, five pounds of explosive, the whole aircraft goes, and the, and the 747 with 450 passengers will, will collapse. So th this is the first thing we have to realize. If we succeed on one hand to prevent as I say, it's state and government support, and not only by military means, definitely not, on the contrary, first and foremost by political economic boycott on those countries, by not allowing any aircraft, any airline to fly into those countries, not accepting their airliners, boycotting their products, that's the first thing. Then by military operations, and not the kind you had in Libya. I would like to see a surgical kind of strike that goes directly at the terrorists and not at hitting Libyan aircraft. What do Libyan, how would you expect Libyan aircraft to be shot down to have an impact on terrorism? That, that isn't, and this won't deter Gaddafi or Libya from doing what they did. Three, by something that I'm sorry this country hasn't been doing for many years, by covert operation, clandestine operation whether it is uh, trying to make a coup against Gaddafi or even to assassinate Gaddafi or directly hit the terrorists. And last, by teaching your own people that it's a long war and you shouldn't lose stamina after the first casualty. Mm -hmm. Mr. Wright, what do you think of that prescription? Well, I think that uh, he's right on many counts. I. His, uh, fir his first point, that, let me that, ask you about his first point first, because there was a, a list of them, uh, uh, which goes to what you were saying. He says you have to go first at the state-supported terrorists, even though there may be this proliferation that you've talked about of all these little cells and groups with no direct connections who operate independently. You must go first at the state-supported ones, the obvious ones. Uh, do you agree with that? Well, again, I think that's talking in simplistic terms. I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I don't agree with what the Reagan administration calls state-supported terrorism. I think in many cases it is state-inspired that governments aid and abet, but I don't, I'm not necessarily convinced that they are actually masterminding uh, these incidents. Even in the case and of I, Gaddafi? 
Uh, I think that he probably may have been involved. Obviously, the administration says there is a smoking gun in the uh, West Berlin disco incident, but I think in the past that a lot of the incidents have been carried out by people he has provided with training facilities, weaponry, funds, and other points, but uh, is not necessarily the responsibility or the masterminding uh, by uh, Colonel Gaddafi. How can a country, let me ask you both, start all over again on this, how can a country which is a superpower, which has global responsibilities, military and otherwise, and global interests, protect its citizen in this age of terrorism that you say is the number one threat to civilized society. How does it, how does it go about doing that? Well, let me start by it saying... Isn't, Israel is a much smaller country no, I, I, with much fewer responsibilities and much less extended. Yeah. The first thing is to teach your people that there is no protection. There is no perfect cure. And once in a while there will be a bomb, there will be an assassination, and you have to learn to live with it. That's the first thing and the most important thing. Then, I'm afraid I have to go back to what I said before. Try to deprive terrorists from state support. And it's not the masterminding. Really, that isn't important. The terrorists don't need somebody to tell them what is the target. They need weapons. They need a way. They need documentation, how to move from one country to another. They need shelter. They need a diplomatic pouch to transfer their weapons. That's what they need. And this is only what the state can provide. And then come all the rest. Miss mm -hmm. Wright, you, you seem to fundamentally disagree at the beginning with the, with the need to take military action against them at all. Were you suggesting that the only way is political and diplomatic, trying to understand what is motivating the terrorists and attack that problem? Absolutely, and I think that U.S. foreign policy has, by and large, been reactive rather than trying to thoughtfully develop a posi uh, policy that will deal with the root causes of these problems. I mean, we all felt a sense of euphoria when the Achille Loro hijackers were brought down over Egypt, or uh, after they uh, fled Egypt. But I think the, the bottom line is that you do not eliminate the root causes behind street crime by nearly nabbing four street muggers. I think it's a much broader phenomena, and I think we have to begin dealing with why this terrorist phenomena has become such a major problem, particularly to Western targets, and deal with those issues rather than just dealing with what our military can accomplish in the way of eliminating military bases or our intelligence people um, finding out what the diplomatic pouches between Libya and Syria are trying uh, to accomplish or conceal. Uh, General Gazid, uh, underlying I causes. Yeah. So I would like to remark on one single fact. Why is this such a threat to Western civilization and not to the Soviet bloc? For two reasons. You can't do it in the Soviet Union. They have much more stronger protective measures. And the punishment will be much crueler. But they also have a police state. That's the, that was the first point, I said. They are much better protected against terrorists. But the punishment will be much more painful. Mm -hmm. And people know you, you don't start with them. Well, let's enlarge this discussion, Judy. For a final view, we turn to Rodney Wallace, the top security expert of the International Air Transport Association, which represents most of the nation's major airlines. He recently returned from inspecting the airports in Cairo and Athens, and he joins us tonight from Montreal. Mr. Wallace, what can you tell us about the incident today at Heathrow Airport, any more than what we've learned already? Probably very little. Um, I've obviously been in touch with uh, London to find out precisely what had happened. The reports which I have indicate that uh, the uh, second security check at Heathrow for the LL departure was successful in identifying that certain explosive material was being carried uh, in, a, in a bag. Um, the person who was uh, carrying the bag has been uh, apprehended. I understand questioning is uh, still going on. Um, beyond that, uh, there is very little that I can say at this stage. Obviously, the British police are conducting the uh, inquiry. Might that bag have gotten through if it hadn't been El Al Airlines with its extra security measures? Well, of course, El Al uh, and indeed other airlines and other airports where there is a specific security risk do have additional uh, security procedures in force. Uh, this was a, a natural uh, program which they operate uh, in Heathrow and it was, of course, successful. Well, with, with all the recent, with all the rash of terrorist incidents we've seen recently, why aren't other airlines now able to adopt many of the same 
procedures that El Al has adopted? It's a question of perception of uh, risk. Uh, at this point in time, of course, El Al, and indeed in the past, El Al has recognized that they are an airline under threat, and they have to take extraordinary uh, uh, measures in order to protect themselves, their passengers, uh, and their uh, crews. Uh, and in certain other parts of the world, and with certain airlines, additional measures are indeed taken. Now, for the bulk of the world, of course, uh, and we have to get this into proper perspective, for the bulk of the world, that threat isn't there, and other airlines haven't seen it uh, as necessary, nor have governments to go to those extreme lengths. We just mentioned that you had just come back from inspecting airports in Cairo and Athens. What did you find? Well, as you know, the uh, general standard of security at both uh, Cairo and Athens is indeed up to the level prescribed by the International Civil Aviation Organization. And in fact, in certain instances, in both places, it goes slightly beyond uh, the prescribed requirements in that there is a double security screening, very much like the one you've just described in respect of El Al in London. So it goes beyond that. Uh, because of the attention which uh, the terrorists have paid in the past to uh, Athens, the Greek authorities have tightened up their security on the ramp and elsewhere, and indeed it is a very good security system at the moment. Would you recommend that, uh, would you tell Americans thinking about traveling to Europe that both of those air airports are safe uh, for them to travel through? I wouldn't describe any airport in the terms of uh, safe or unsafe. There are varying degrees uh, of threat in these places, and of course, as we know in the uh, recent past, the uh, United States citizens have had uh, the focus uh, of attention of the terrorists placed on them. But nevertheless, as far as the governments of those countries are concerned, and the airport authorities, and the airlines themselves, the level of security applied is indeed high, and everything is being done to make sure that the passengers traveling through, be they Americans or any other nationality, are indeed uh, able to travel through safely. How then should a person, person make a decision about whether to make that trip to the Middle East or to Europe? I think that has to be on a personal basis, uh, of course. Um, one of the great problems, I, I think, is that if uh, people who are planning to take holidays or, or journey for other reasons do stay behind, that there's always that underlying, uh, underlying feeling, of course, that the terrorist has uh, imposed his will on, on the traveling public, which is something of a victory for the terrorist. Um, but nevertheless, the, uh, each individual has to weigh up the situation for himself, has to assess the, the, the uh, potential uh, for problem uh, and then make his own decision. I think we should get everything into perspective, however. I mean, there are vast numbers of uh, Americans who do indeed travel regularly on, on a, and travel, uh, traveling on a daily basis um, okay. without any untoward incident whatsoever. But well, of course, when you get a, well, a, a major um, activity such as a bombing or a hijacking, then well, quite naturally it concentrates everybody on that particular incident. Well, Rodney Wallace, we thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you.